from the American media. I'm sorry to say that, one of, that none of this has had the slightest effect on what is a, an impervious, not to say granitic will, on the part of a tiny number of members of George Bush's administrations who plan to go forward with a war among whose stated intentions is the unilateral wish to bring American-style democracy to Iraq and the Arab world, redrawing maps, overturning governments and states and modes of life on a fantastically wide scale in the process. That all this has very little to do with the enhancements of human rights in a part of the world especially rife with their abuse, in my opinion, is patently obvious. Were Iraq to have been the world's largest exporter of oranges, there would have been no concern over its purported possession of weapons of mass destruction or its extraordinarily cruel and tyrannical regime. This is a war planned for resources and for strategic control. And whether or not it occurs, there is still some small room for doubt about that, given the huge number of protests all over the world, a deeply encouraging sign. The US, the US, or its government, has at very least asserted its strategic dominance over the center of the world's largest known energy reserves, from the Gulf to the Caspian Sea, and plans to reshape the area by pacifying threats to its dominance in countries like Syria, Iran, and some of, the small, uh, some of the Gulf Emirates. To threaten war with such belligerence and such a wasteful deployment of military resources is an abuse of human tolerance and human values, that it might in the end turn out to be only a display rather than an actual use of force only deepens anxiety about the kind of world we are moving toward. Note also that by the end of the decade, China will be importing as much oil as the United States. And by 2025, the United States will need to import a full 75% of its oil needs from the Gulf region in particular. As against those mighty facts, whether people are prevented from getting an education or from being allowed to move, express themselves, and organize freely without fear, either of intimidation, collective punishment, or assassination, may seem therefore like relatively humdrum, if not entirely trivial issues. But they do pertain with a frightening parallelism to both the people of Palestine and the people of Iraq. In either and both cases, my point here is to assert the universal applicability of human rights to those unfortunate people, given that since World War II, there has grown up an impressive, even formidable worldwide consensus that each individual or collectivity, no matter his or her color, ethnicity, religion, or culture, is to be protected from such horrific practices as starvation, torture, the forced transfer of populations, religious discrimination, humiliation, extrajudicial political assassinations, land expropriation, and all manner of similar cruel and unusual punishment. I want to affirm also that no power, no matter how special or how developed or how strong or how urgent its claims of past victimization and present mission, is exempt from accusation and judgment if that government practices such things. And finally, no people or individuals can be singled out as exceptions to these general rules so as to be considered, in fact, liable for such abrogations of human rights as those I've mentioned. We live in a secular, historical world. History is the product of human labor, choice, and will. Nothing transcendental or divine can supersede that truth or suspend the consequences that flow from its application. There simply is no convincing way to assert special claims whose origin is divine edict, claims that supposedly legitimate high altitude or smart bombing 
or the use of 60-ton bulldozers to demolish the houses of poor and defenseless people who don't happen to belong to the correct religion or race. Just as I feel as an American that the United States has not been divinely endowed with a special errand into the wilderness, despite what George Bush says, and that its practices are endorsed by God, which I don't believe, I feel it is our moral and intellectual duty to oppose the unjust use of its immense military, economic, and political power abroad for what the George Bush administration claims falsely to be its national security interests. I have no power, so I must resort to the tools of education, to writing, and speaking. By the same token, I want to reiterate my conviction here that the specific case of the denial of the human rights of the Palestinian people by the State of Israel, supported by the United States, cannot at all be justified on any, on any of the grounds routinely accepted by far too many individuals and governments who would be the first to object to similar behavior in other cases. So far from Israel, so far from Israel and the Palestinians being a special case of unusual and exceptional circumstances, I think the exact opposite is true. That because Palestine is perhaps of all places on earth the one most densely saturated with cultural and religious significance, precisely that reality makes it an instance of universality thwarted and flouted, the universality of human coexistence, human acceptance of the other, and human construction of a just and fair society for all, and certainly not only some of its residents. The point is that no state, no state at all, is in my opinion entitled legitimately to object to these formulations. And certainly no leader can state unarguably, for example, as George Bush has, that the United States is good and its enemies evil, or as General Sharon has announced, and I quote now, that we are placing no restrictions on our operations in the Palestinian territories. Israel is under no pressure. No one is criticizing us, he says, or has the right to do so, end of quote. I would submit that such sweeping statements of higher purpose such sweeping statements of higher purpose and extraordinary impunity must be opposed and intellectually dismantled for the thuggish balderdash that such pronouncements really are. Especially, especially if they are intended to cover or explain or excuse or somehow justify barbaric devastation and vast ruin. Yet the contrast between the immensely powerful and the relatively powerless is not so simple, since the great outcry all over the world against the U.S. war today, the unilateral U.S. war, and the felt need by even government spokesmen, American government spokespeople, to reiterate a general American commitment to democracy and human rights does, in fact, reveal a profoundly, profound worldly awareness that, aside from comfort and convenience, Human beings today expect to be respected, their requirements for a decent life met, their wish recognized not to be tortured or detained unlawfully, their concern for their children and their livelihoods accepted despite the supposedly higher priorities asserted by great power. All these, in theory at least, are rarely challenged head on and considered to be human entitlements even if such terrible abstractions as are used today, the national interests, the national unity, and so on, are affirmed as superseding individual rights. I don't believe they do and can never be allowed to. This unattractive un and unacceptable argument certainly now prevails in the US, where education and history, for instance, has become a profoundly ideological battleground between proponents of a kind of heroic, primitive, white American nationalism and the much more sensible advocates of the multicultural, multiracial reality stressed, for instance, in his work by the prominent historian Howard Zinn. This is, after all, an immigrant society, and to pretend that it's a kind of an English, uh, a, de a derivation exclusively from England is uh, a, a preposterous mistake. 